Pacific herring in the eastern Pacific range from Baja, California to the Beaufort Sea. I'll be using mostly DFO and State of Washington references. They also range quite a bit in size. In 1980, 10-year-old herring in yellow peaked at 250 millimeters and 220 grams. But since then, they have fallen over the years. In 2022, 10-year-olds are 200 millimeters and 125 grams. Let's start before contact. First Nations have traditional ecological knowledge, successful for many millennia, as given by the elders and listed in the IFMP. At the end of a cold winter, the herring returned to spawn on hemlock, cedar, kelp, and eelgrass. They also bring other valuable resources, such as ducks, geese, seals, chinook, halibut, and cod. As the spawn moves down the shore, branches are quietly set at low tide, and, in a, and a convenient tree is felled. The herring oblige and spawn upon them. The spawn is ate then, or smoked for later and trade. The spawn-laden tree is towed by canoe to the village. In this case, the village of Namu. All year round, for millennia, Herring existed in every little cove and cranny of 17s, 18, and 19, as told by traditional ecological knowledge and Simon Fraser archaeology. Using 3 millimeter screens on middens, hundreds of years old, they determined that herring were eaten every day for four millennia. A legend is told by Randy Fred from Vancouver Island University that herring were the resource available to women and children. Spawn was easy to collect and smoked well, and fresh herring were had with a small canoe and a rake, and fresh herring smoked well as well. A woman and a child could eat herring summer and winter and have some to trade as well. Herring sexually mature at age three, 170 millimeters by 75 grams, and in late winter collect to ripen in the deeper waters. They then move onshore and spawn in the intertidal regions, generally on vegetation, but also on nylon, creosote pilings, and concrete pilings. The eggs survive, if not killed by no fertilization. Let's look closely at this piling wrapped in EnviroWrap. We can see the individual lines of eggs laid. This is a weak spawn. The milk quite likely could have missed these individual lines of eggs. These are eggs clumped on eelgrass from a squimalt. I believe the not fertilized are gray and the fertilized have big googly eyes. The eggs then have to survive predation, either natural, fresh, or smoked. There's also freezing at low tide, desiccation when thrown by the waves above the high tide, creosote or oil slick, especially in False Creek, and furthermore, <clears throat> oxygen starvation and CO2 suffocation. Seaweed photosynthesizes CO2 into O2, and I think the herring can smell that oxygen. And they lay their eggs on the seaweed. The eggs are washed with fresh, fresh oxygenated water every wave. The eggs get oxygen from their substrate, and the substrate absorbs their CO2. This is Japanese sargassum, an invasive weed at Nanoa Rock, Nanus Bay. It is said to have been brought here as packing for imported live Japanese oyster. <coughs> oysters. And it has done well since it got here. The herrings seem to like it as a spawning substrate. I have a theory that fresh cut branches of hemlock and fir are still photosynthesizing. And so the herring lay on those branches and so the eggs reap the benefits. Anchored against the flow, O2 plentiful, CO2 disposed of, that is my theory. The preferred spawning substrate here in Victoria and the gorge is eelgrass. These eggs are from the squimalt spawn of 2022 and as you can see the googly eyes are developing. Life is not easy for some. This poor larvae struggled for at least one hour and 21 minutes and then my camera memory was full. They're tough from a squimalt. 
the herring accept their responsibilities and support multiple predators. I saw a school of herring at Causeway Marina, probably stretched about three quarters of the way across the marina. This school <coughs> was big enough to attract seals. Just one seal at first, but by final count there were seven. And gradually the school either snuck away in the night or got predated very heavily because both herring and seals were gone in a few days. In pre-contact days, these seals would have attracted harpoons and become a rich stew for an ailing grandmother, as well as floats for whalers. A large school of juvenile herring close to the village is not worthy of harvest, but the bounty of salmon, halibut, ducks, geese, and sea otters close to the village are worthy of harvest. The lifelong predation continues for these juvenile herring as they mature and prepare for that inevitable migration. Inevitable? Not if you're a residential herring. Residential herring are not currently recognized by DFO herring managers, but residential herring do exist, notwithstanding DFO management denial. The evidence is tech. There was herring in every cove and bay for millennia. And then the other evidence, archeological abundance of herring as studied by Simon Fraser University and well-cited DFO researcher Terry Beecham and J.F. Swaggart, yet analyzing microsatellite variation, identified four stocks of Pacific herring in BC waters. In the summer, in a single seine, near Seashelt, adult herring, obviously non-migratory, were tested. 64% of the seine were the predominant March spawners, and they spawn on the east coast of Vancouver Island and they were thought to be migratory. 23% of the seine was the mainland inlet herring. They spawn in the mainland inlet heads and move only as far as the mouth of the inlet to live and feed. And 9% were from San Juan, semi-migratory. DFO researcher Luke Rogers writes, contaminants and stable isotopes show that some populations reside in coastal waters and estuaries. This is from the Washington State Research. Persistent organic pollutants collect in tissue, and this is one good clue of residence. Another clue is otolith analysis of stable isotopes. And the third, Washington State found two specific genomes in their waters. One at Cherry Point, the late spawners, and the other way down south at Susquehan Pass. Using these three tools, POP, otolith analysis, and microsatellite variation, Washington State has labeled 21 separate stocks of herring. The Suxquan Pass are the most resi resident, and the Cherry Point and Kilsheen are the most migratory. Please let me add my anecdotal evidence. As a longtime recreational fisher, I was taught how to rake herring and send them back down again for springs. There was always lots of herring in residence in Pender Harbor, Actifass, and Campbell River. In winter and summer, Fat springs lived under the herring. The other type of herring migrates to La Perouse Bank off of Bamfield. The old assumption that all Denman Hornby herring migrate has been disproved by Beecham of DFO Science. Some migrate and some stay resident. The fisheries, spawn on kelp, roe, and winter fisheries. The First Nations practice spawn on kelp or branch and winter fisheries. This has been a sustainable fishery for millennia, sustainable in the proven phenomenal herring biomass, and sustainable in the reliable source of food. Macrocystis, a perennial kelp, is the favored spawn on kelp on the outer coast. Hemlock is the preferred branch in the Salish Sea, where macro doesn't grow. There is a modern adaptation to increase efficiency and market appeal called the closed pond. Ripening herring are sowed, saned, and towed alive, slow and easy, to a four-sided pond with nets forming the enclosure. In the center, kelp and branches are hung. 
The herring, hopefully most survived, are locked in until they spawn, and then they are released. After the fishers take out their preferred spawn, leftover eggs are left to hatch out. The closed pond is taken apart then. Closed ponds are not used right now. Open Ponds A herring attractive pond with at least one open side is built. The kelp or branch is enticingly laid and the herring will hopefully oblige. Presently, Hiltsiuk Nation and Central Coast Region have a spawn on kelp harvest and trade. Currently, the problems with this are there must be sufficient spawning biomass to spawn multiple eggs deep. Unfortunately, today the row fishery takes place first and this directly affects the spawning biomass. The ripening herring are holding in known deep waters and are easily found with fish finders and tracked as they move through the shallower waters to the spawning beaches. When the herring get to exactly the same depth as the seine is deep, the seine is set and many tons are seined up. The remaining herring are scattered in the noise and confusion. The spawn on kelp near the saners is sparse due to the scattering herring and many tons less of them. The other more common problem is that the herring biomass is quite low. For instance, the biomass of the central coast is still low. When the spawning biomass is lower, the spawn locations can be quite random as detailed by the Haida Gwaii rebuilding plan, and it becomes quite difficult to know where to set the kelp for spawn. Not like in the old days when the herring spawned in almost every little nook and cranny and cove of Sailor Sea. Then the spawning herring would be announced by the sea lions, seals and eagles, and the spawns would last for days, not hours. Then it was easy to figure out where to set the branches or kelp. Another problem with the spawn on kelp is the supply of quality macrocystis is difficult. The province of BC regulates macro harvest and macro is suffering a coastwide decline. Another problem is food safe concerns of distributing wild harvest raw seafood. This trade is mainly between First Nations. Winter and summer fisheries. Since herring spawn in the spring, any fishery that occurs any other time of the year is lumped into the winter fisheries category. This includes First Nations herring rake, the reduction fishery, and modern food and bait and special use seine fisheries. The First Nation herring rake was only successful because herring were plentiful in every bay of the Salish Sea every day for millennia. You can't feed yourself today with a small canoe and a rake. The herring are too scarce and scattered. Herring will ball up as their defense to predation. Fish and seals from below, ducks and gulls from the top. Such a, commission, such a commotion would attract the rake and small canoe and some would be harvested but then some would be sent down as bait for Chinook, halibut, and cod. Can anyone figure the productivity of herring stocks given the amount of herring harvested versus the amount and type of predators harvested? Is it 100% with canoe and rake harvest only, or 120% with seal harvest only? As documented in traditional ecological knowledge, and the archaeological evidence of Simon Fraser University, the herring rake fishery was sustainable for millennia. Reduction fishery. In the early 1800s in Japan, herring were multitudinous and easily trapped from the shore. Applied to rice fields, the rice production exploded. Herring harvest reached a maximum of, in 1897 of 975,000 tons in that one year alone. Sounds incredulous, but the figure comes from this here book. What gave Japanese Pacific herring such incredibly massive biomass? Shortly thereafter, Japanese herring collapsed, followed by the Russian, Alaskan, and Canadian herring collapse. The reduction fishery, as described in the Haida Gwaii rebuilding plan, 
skittigat herring have never fully recovered, they are still extirpated. The BC catch records record that from 1950 to 1967, 2,945,000 metric tons of herring were harvested. Here in Victoria, the reduction fishery DFO data show in 1958, 5,847 tons were harvested, and in 1959, 16,729 tons were harvested. In 1967, the herring populations in Canada collapsed and the fisheries were closed. Herring started to recover somewhat, and then a new market was found. Roe Fishery The herring will have been holding in deep water, ripening. And as they ripen, they move towards the spawning grounds. When they get to depth of water that equals the depth of the seine net, they get seined. The females, ideally, are a day or two before spawning. Their row sac is big with crunchy eggs. They get a good price, but not the best price. But seining is cheaper than gill netting per ton. The best quality comes from a gill netter, harvesting in very shallow waters just hours before the spawn. The herring are spawned close to their spawning grounds, so in theory DFO managers could say fisheries closed due to lack of spawn at this location. However, DFO data and DFO science will show this has not been done yet. DFO Nanaimo Biological Station writes that the low biomass and low productivity of herring in Haida Gwaii, Central Coast, and West Coast of Vancouver Island is due to overharvest in the 1990s, which was the sac row fishery time. Let's look at Haida Gwaii a little more carefully and refer to the Haida Gwaii Re Herring Rebuilding Plan issued last year. It's co-authored by DFO Herring Management of Haida Gwaii, the Council of Haida Nation, and Parks Canada. Skittigat Inlet was destroyed by the reduction fishery, but the rest of the substocks were overharvested by the row fishery. In the spring of 2023, only 1,528 tons returned to spawn in the entire Haida Gwaii. This is the lowest ever recorded for Haida Gwaii. In the Canadian Sciences Advisory Secretary Research document, DFO Science writes about the Ali effect, the inefficiencies of external fertilization and continued predation on diminishing stocks threaten Northwest cod with extirpation, even in the absence of fishing. With a low, low, low return of 1,584 tons of spawners, and with the returning biomass clearly trending down this past decade, the Haida Gwaii herring are just a statistic away from extinction, courtesy of the sacro fishery, according to DFO Science. Furthermore, DFO Risk Assessment Appendix 13 has relabeled the row Sane and roe gillnet as high risk to stocks. Winter and summer fisheries. Modern food and bait and special use sane fisheries also take place summer, winter, and fall. These two fisheries target herring that are not spawning. As DFO scientist Terry Beecham showed, three separate stocks were mingled in one summer test sane, suggesting that the food and bait and special use saners cannot know which stock they are harvesting. Washington State has identified 21 different stocks in the southern Sailor Sea, and there's every reason to believe that the same substock structure for the northern Sailor Sea did at one time exist. However, the food and bait fishery started harvesting heavily in 2014 in the Strait of Georgia. Let's refer to the IFMP Appendix 9, the food and bait fishery. In 2016, First Nations south of Nanaimo warned their spawns were disappearing. The DFO spawn maps show the spawns disappearing as well. During the time of disappearing spawns, DFO put catch caps on the food and bait fishery south of Nanaimo. In 2018, DFO started closing the food and bait. Region 17S, Southern Inside Gulf Islands, and 18, Saanich Inlet to Ganges, were closed. Then in 2019, Region 295, outside shores of Gulf Islands, were closed. All regions are still closed, with small, random, and unconfirmed spawns. 
if the Washington State research is correct, and if south of Nanaimo had the same substock structure as Puget Sound, either the herring have decided to spawn somewhere else, which is current DFO herring management policy, or they were over-harvested. The food and bait and special use seine fisheries, closed south of Nanaimo since 2020, have been harvesting north of Nanaimo, and there has been no spawn in the previously productive Lanceville and Nanaimo spawning grounds in either 2022 or 2023. And the risk assessment has been changed to high risk for stocks for the food and bait fishery. There is no longer any sustainable herring fishery south of Nanaimo. DFO herring management has to balance conservation of stocks to ensure sustainable fishing opportunities and First Nations rights to harvest herring and spawn as before and Canadian citizens' opportunities to fish and make a living. Not easy. The way of herring stock management has been this. DFO Science sends out specially trained dive survey teams out to the spawning grounds and they measure the spawn using statistical methods and send the data in. And in July, DFO has the algorithms all calculated up and they announce how many tons of herring spawned. In the spring of 2023, 74,507 tons spawned in the Strait of Georgia. Next, using this known spawning biomass, DFO Science calculates the biological reference points with a very wide range of structural uncertainties and declares the expected return of herring to spawn next spring. For instance, let's look at the Strait of Georgia. In late of 2022, DFO Science calculated the estimated return of spawning herring in the spring of 23 to be 68,114 tons, but there was a range of 36,412 tons to 135,149 tons. The return could be as low as 36,000 tons, it could be as high as 135,000 tons. The reason for this wide disparity in calculated return of spawning herring is given in a CSAS document authored by DFO Science Nanaimo. There are too many unknown factors determining biological reference points. How was the spawn survival? Did a lot get frozen in a freak winter snap? How was the larva survival? What factors affect larvae and to what extent? How was the juvenile predation this year? Were there lots of seals about? How was the adult predation? Were there more humpbacks around? It's just too many unknown factors in the calculations and therefore such a wide range of expected return. A lot more research and data is required to make the BRPs accurate. Let's consider some recent calculations of expected return. Haida Gwaii calculated return for the spring of 23, as published in 2022, 14,835 tons median, with a range of 6,808 to 32,589 tons. Actual measured return, as per the data summary 2023, 1,584 tons, about 10% of the calculated return a long ways out of range. Another example is the west coast of Vancouver Island. The IFMP in, 19, in 2022 estimated the return in spring of 23 to be 22,375 tons median, with a range of 11,425 tons to 44,181 tons. The actual measured return is per the data summary of 23, 77,005 tons, 344% of the calculated return. Once again, a long ways out of range. The IFMP for the Strait of Georgia in 22 calculated the estimated return for the spring of 23 to be 68,114 tons median, with a range of 36,412 tons to 13549 tons. Actual measured return, as per the data summary of 23, 74,507 tons, about 110% of the calculated return. The food and bait, special use, and row fisheries, apparently, cannot plan marketing, processing, and harvesting on an unknown herring return somewhere between 36,000 tons and 135,000 tons. 
DFO management has to give them some figure to take to the bank, so the median estimated return is used. Next, the harvest rate must be determined. In years gone past, 20% of estimated median return was used. DFO Science has now determined that 20% harvest is no longer considered sustainable. A 10% harvest of the median calculated return is a new sustainable figure. Therefore, the fleet is to be given a harvest of 10% of 68,114 tons, or 6,811 tons, to be harvested, whatever the return. Now the fishers can be hired, the processors hired, and the bank satisfied. Now, if only 36,412 tons return to spawn, then the effective harvest rate will be about 19%, a significant overharvest according to DFO Science. As it turned out, 74,507 tons was the measured return of the DFO data summary of 2023, so the harvest rate was 9%, a slight underharvest. There is no longer a sustainable food and bait special use or row fishery in Haida Gwaii, Central Coast, West Coast of Vancouver Island, South of Nanaimo, or Sunshine Coast. The earliest documented transplant of herring on the BC coast took place in Hiltsiuk Nation, as recorded by Frank Franz Bowes in the Bella Bella Tales, published in 1932. Raven, he recorded, transplanted herring to the village of Nulu, Simon Fraser University research in an archaeological study of the middens found Nulu shows an abundance of herring bones from 2400 years ago, whereas nearby Namu shows an abundance of herring bones from 700 or 7000 years ago. Transplant of herring could be as innocent as towing that spawn covered tree home to the village. The heavily laden branches would be taken out as harvest, but the less laden branches would be left to hatch out on the village beach, or sometimes it was as calculated as getting Raven to do the work. Many years ago, the Squamish screen keepers were wondering why are so few of their carefully released salmon fry returning as adults? Could it be a lack of adult salmon food, a lack of herring? Through diligent ob observations, herring spawn was found, and through diligent experimentation and great volunteer effort, the nylon enforcement panel was developed. Herring were found to spawn in creosote pilings with low survivability due to creosote poisoning and the ever-present oil slick washing up and down with each tide cycle and effectively smothering the eggs. The nylon enhancement panel is the partial answer. If herring are in the spawning mood and if the nylon panels are right there right then, then some spawn will be laid on the nylon enhancement panel. The nylon enhancement panel provides oxygenated water from both sides and rides five centimeters below the oil slick at all times because it's secured to the floating docks, which keeps the eggs off the bottom and away from ravenous crabs. Who would have thunk? Busy, busy, False Creek, downtown Vancouver, crisscrossed by ambulance sirens, three bridges, ferries and boats, but the herring return to spawn every winter. So far, False Creek, downtown Vancouver, has the only returning spawning herring in BC that will willingly spawn on nylon enhancement panels. The success of the Squamish stream keepers in False Creek was quickly copied in English Bay, Bowen Island, Sunshine Coast, Victoria, Sydney, Ganges, and Nanaimo. Alas, no luck, no herring volunteered to spawn on our volunteer efforts. In the spring of 2021, Herring spawn was transferred from Falls Creek to Coal Harbor, Burrard Inlet. This was no easy task. Researcher Doug Swanston had to get approval from DFO and the Seal Watooth Nation. 10% of the Falls Creek spawn, laid on very easily transported nylon panels, were driven across town in an hour and put into Coal Harbor. The approval was the hard part, proving to DFO that the transplanted herring were not going to compete with any small remnant population that had not been observed, and that the herring spawn would have a reasonable chance of surviving the Coal Harbor waters. The actual transport was easy. The spawn covered nylon, was simply lowered into a chili bin and then loaded into a truck, and driven around to Coal Harbor for the transplant. Surprisingly, Coal Harbor has a healthy eelgrass meadow. The experiment is three years old and they are searching for returning spawners in Coal Harbor. You could volunteer to do snorkel surveys in Coal Harbor. Hopefully the transplant will take and we will learn more about transplanting so as to have 
to replace the missing resident herring from Soup, Victoria, the Southern Gulf Islands, and the Sunshine Coast. You can imagine how hard it is to tag tiny, fragile herring and search through the millions harvested for those tiny tags to get any valid science about herring homing to their natal beach. But it was done and determined that 30% of the herring stray and spawn away. So the implications seem to be that if a natal beach is full of spawners, 30% 30, 30 will stray and repopulate empty suitable beaches. The only published DFO restoration plan is the Haida Gwaii Herring Rebuilding Plan. Some recent changes in DFO management guidance made it necessary for DFO to develop a rebuilding plan. To DFO's credit, DFO, after four years of effort, co-authored with the Council of Haida Gwaii and Parks Canada the Haida Gwaii Rebuilding Plan. This is an important document agreed to by DFO, Council of Haida Nations, and Parks Canada and it gives us important herring rebuilding guidelines. To begin, if a rebuilding plan is to succeed, one must first know what caused the problem. It's no use to spend a million dollars in 10 years on habitat re rehabilitation if that's not the problem. The problem is clearly labeled as overfishing, and so the stocks will be managed differently going forward. Herring stocks will now be managed on the sub-stock level. Large area-based harvest quotas can destroy small substocks, as witnessed south of Nanaimo. This problem is recognized by the University of British Columbia as well. To paraphrase, fishing quotas must now be set separately for the thousands of small resident populations. Continuing to use larger spatial, spatial scales will lead to extirpation of many populations. The Haida Gwaii rebuilding plan also gives rebuilding targets. Fishing closures must remain in effect until the herring stocks get to a biomass equal to previous years and the herring stocks show positive productivity. Then open net spawn kelp will be considered. DFO risk assessment for open pond spawn on kelp fisheries is low.